Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Uni Zor Education. Um, we continue talking about semiconductors. Um, in the previous lecture, we were talking about um, um, crystalline structure of uh, silicon and um, using certain impurities uh, like phosphorus or boron, um, we have achieved this semiconductivity. Um, today I would like to um, explain in more detail about what actually is this crystalline uh, structure, what holds this crystalline structure and why certain elements have this type of structure and why impurities can actually um, contribute to conductivity in this particular case. Now, the reason for all for, 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 for these links between the uh, atoms and, and molecules is something which is called covalent uh, bonds. And today we will talk about covalent bonds between atoms. Okay, now this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens. It's presented on unizor.com website. Um, the website contains the course. It's not just lectures which are not related to each other. I mean, you can find this lecture on YouTube, for instance, uh, and any other lectures actually are there physically. But what combines them together is software, which is on unizor.com. So it, pre <coughs> it presents you the menu, uh, it has um, basically a very logical structure, so every further um, material depends on the previous one. Uh, it also has exams which you can take. <coughs> you can take them anonymously, you don't have to sign in. Um, the, the, uh, this website is completely free, no strings attached, and as I said, you don't even have to um, sign in into the in, into the website. I mean, there are certain um, benefits if you sign in, but that's completely in, uh, un unrelated to material presented. Now, there is a prerequisite course on the same website. It's called Math for Teens, and I believe math is extremely important for uh, well, <laughs> for general understanding of how things are arranged and in f for physics specifically. So I do suggest you to be familiar at least. I mean, you don't have to take the course if you know um, whatever is in there, but the material presented in the Mass for Teens uh, course is very important for physics. Okay, so covalent bonds. Um, we were talking about silicon and sometimes germanium, that's another element, which are base for semiconductors. So they both make this um, structure, this crystalline structure, which is very important for semiconductivity. So um, let me start from uh, something which you definitely know about, but I'll put it in a little bit different perspective the structure of the atom. Um, we actually talked about this many times, especially I talked about this when we were talking about um, uh, using the sunlight to generate electricity, solar power. Um, so the atom, as we know, contains a nucleus and electrons. Now, what I didn't tell before, and that's extremely important, um, the nucleus is in the center and electrons are rotating around it. I mean, that's our model. It's not like physically like planets uh, rotating around the sun. It's more like a cloud of electrons and uh, at any particular moment they can be in different places. But what's very important, and again, I didn't talk about this before, um, the orbits are um, fixed, so to speak. There are certain um, finite number of orbits where electrons can be um, 
located and again orbit is actually like a ring it has certain um, I don't know thickness if you wish but in any case it's like an energy level so the electrons which are rotating on a particular radius have certain energy and electrons which are rotating on a further orbit they have their own energy and there is nothing in between so to speak so this is related to quantum theory quantum mechanics um, the theory which basically um, has this characteristics of anything being not um, in some kind of a smooth um, number of values uh, it doesn't really fill completely any kind of a segment of energy level from here to here. It can be only on certain distinct positions. So if you have an atom, if this is a nucleus, then there is one orbit and there is another orbit and there is a third orbit. And these orbits have fixed radius, so to speak. I mean, you can view this as a fixed radius. So electrons cannot be on this radius, can be either this or that, or further. So this um, uh, space between the orbits is, is not populated by, by, by electrons. And again, it's related to certain uh, quantum approach to um, structure of the atom. And experiments actually um, confirms that this is much closer to whatever reality is. I mean, this quantum model of the atom is much closer to reality. It confirmed, it's confirmed by experiments than something which you might actually have in mind when you were just talking about electrons rotating on certain orbits around the atom. So we were not thinking about this uh, distinct levels. It's all related to energy and energy cannot be like divided infinitely down to infinitesimal values. It has certain quantum, whatever the quantum is. Now, the second thing which is very important is that electrons, as they are rotating um, around the nucleus, nucleus has protons and neutrons, so the protons are positively charged and they are attracting electrons. Now electrons are rotating and again it's in some way uh, equivalent to rotating Earth around, around the Sun. So we have two forces. Um, because it's rotating with certain speed if you wish, um, it's trying basically to get away but the um, uh, attraction of the protons in the nucleus is not letting it out of the orbit. So that's how it's rotating all the time, being attracted to um, the nucleus, to the protons in the nucleus. But at the same time, if you have certain fixed orbit, if you have certain number of electrons, they are filling up, let's say we have this one, they are filling up the orbit in such a way that there is, there is a certain maximum. I mean, obviously it depends on the radius of the orbit. But uh, the larger the radius, the longer the circumference of this uh, circle, and it looks like we can fit more electrons, so their repelling of each other is not really strong enough to push something out but there is a maximum so a certain orbit certain orbit has certain maximum number of electrons which can fit without pushing each other out from the orbit if by any chance if you have maximum eight on this orbit for instance and you have a ninth electrons here it's immediately pushed to upper level to the next one and if it's already filled up it will be pushed out as well. Maybe, maybe not necessarily that particular electron, but some electron will be pushed out. So there is a certain number, maximum number, um, of electrons which can fit any orbit. 
and I can actually tell you which is this number. So the most, uh, the closest um, orbit around the nucleus has two maximum. The next one, eight. The next one, 18. The next one, 32. Well, the next one actually is not continuing this um, for some reasons which uh, are not actually are the part of this lecture. But this is something which you actually can have in mind. So, by the way, it's 2 n square, where n is the number of the orbit. 1 square is 1 times 2 is 2. 2 square is 4 times 2 is 8. 3 square is 9 times 2 is 18. And 4 square is 16 times 2 is 32. So, this formula for first four orbits actually uh, is held. So, these are maximums not necessarily completely filled up for uh, anything. I mean, obviously, the outermost orbit um, might not actually be completely filled up. You can have 8 and 8, uh, 2 and 8, and then, let's say, 4. And that's, that's all we have, because different elements have different number of protons and electrons. Number of protons is equal to number of electrons, but it can be 1 for hydrogen, it has one proton and one electron, which means the model is this. So this is the nucleus with one proton, and this is a first orbit with only one um, electron. Then the next one is helium, where you have two. And this is already filled up because this is the first orbit. It has two maximum. That's it. The next one is three, four, etc. I mean, we have for, um, I think for any, basically, number within, like, I don't know, 100, 100 and something, we have certain elements. Some of them are stable, some of them are not stable, but we do have elements. Now, um, What's important in certain cases? I do have examples. So these are two examples. Next example I have is carbon. Carbon has 12 um, elementary particle inside of a nucleus, which is six protons, six neutrons. If it has six protons, it has to have six electrons. How they are arranged? Well, two on the lowest orbit and four electrons on the next orbit. So that's the structure of the atom uh, of carbon. And I do have uh, corresponding pictures, by the way, on the website, every lecture has notes, and in the notes I put some pictures, so there are pictures of atoms sim similar to this one, so for carbon. So what's important is that it has completely filled up lower orbit, and the next orbit is filled out, out of eight possible places four electrons are present. Okay, now next one is silicium, which is silicon. Silicium is legend. Okay, silicon has 28 uh, particles, which is 14 protons plus 14 nucleus, uh, uh, neutrons, sorry, not nucleus, protons and neutrons inside the nucleus. It, if it has 14 protons, it has to have 14 electrons. So 2 goes to the lower orbit, 8 goes to the next one, so that's 10, and we have 4 on the outer orbit. So in this case, it looks like this. 
This is still to come. So two, eight. Is it eight here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And four on the outer. So there are three orbits. And we have four electrons on the outer orbit. I would like to say right now that what's what's on the outer orbit is very, very important. And we will talk about this. So far I'm just talking about certain examples. Now what's my next example? Titanium. Okay, titanium has Uh, 48. So it has 22 protons, 26 neutrons, and it ha and obviously it has 22 uh, electrons, which are broken down to two electrons on the first orbit, eight on the next one. Then we have 10 and 2. Now, this is very important and that was quite frankly at some point in the past was a surprise for me. I thought that orbits are supposed to be packed up to the maximum. So maximum is 2, it's filled, maximum is 8, next maximum is 18, so we have only 12, so I thought that we will have 12 electrons on the next orbit. Apparently that's not the case. We have many cases when orbits are not really filled up completely. So in this case, this orbit, it has potentially place for 18 um, uh, electrons, but only 10 are taken, and the next two remaining electrons are going to the outer orbit, the fourth one. Why? I don't know. <laughs> But that, that's the way how it is. Um, and again, what's very important is how many electrons are on the outer orbit. Because outer orbit is something which actually interacts with other atoms. And that's why it's very important how many electrons are on the outer orbit. There is a special name for these electrons, which I will talk about. What's my next example? Now, titanium is a metal, right? We know that. Now, again, I had an impression that the heavier the, uh, the nucleus, the more protons and neutrons it has inside, the heavier element should be. Like, if this is a metal, then it should be uh, heavy, basically. But, lo and behold, we have a gas called radon. Radon, and it has 222 elementary particles in the nucleus out of those 86 protons and 136 neutrons. And 86 electrons are 2 plus 8 plus 18 plus 32. You see the first four uh, 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 orbits are completely filled up, but then I have again 18 and 8. So that's how electrons are distributed among six different orbits. Okay, so these are just examples of how different atoms are structured according to the model which we are accepting right now as, well, the model which describes the world. Is the world really arranged this way? Well, let's just put it aside. It's our model and experiments show that whatever the calculations we do using this model, etc., they correspond to the experiment better than the older model <coughs> when we did not really take into account the quantum um, uh, uh, levels of, of, of energy. Okay. So these are examples of how the atoms are structured and again what's important is what's on the outer orbit. The next important thing is that if you have something which is not filled up on the outer orbit, um, elements have tendency 
to interact with each other. I mean, atoms of elements have this tendency. Now, if the uh, outer orbit is completely filled up, and completely means 2 for the first orbit, 8 for the next one, 18 for the next one. So if these orbits are completely filled up, then there is no way they can actively interact with other. They are complete. It's like there is nothing, there is no holes which other electrons can get into. For instance, from other uh, atoms, electron cannot just jump into this one because the orbit is already completed. So, if it's not filled up, this outer layer, then there is a possibility of interaction. And again, the tendency of the atoms is to interact in some way to fill up their outermost layers. So there is certain magic number uh, for each orbit of filling it up, basically. These are magic numbers. Now, uh, um, you have something which is called noble gases, like uh, argon or helium. They have a complete outer layer. Helium has two, and that's the only thing. Then the next one, I don't remember, has all eight, and these are not really actively engaging into any kind of chemical reaction. But something which is um, some element which is not uh, filling up the outer layer, they are open for interaction. Now, what is interaction? Let me just give you a structure of a molecule. Of, of the gas made methane. Now, methane is CH4. So let's just think about this. C is carbon, H is hydrogen. Carbon has six protons plus six neutrons and six electrons are two plus four. So this is the structure of the atom. This is one orbit, and this is another orbit. Now, hydrogen has only one proton and only one electron on the orbit. So here is what happens. We have four atoms. We have this atom. We have this atom of hydrogen. We have this atom of hydrogen. And we have this atom of hydrogen. You see four electrons and four electrons here. And the magic numbers are in this case eight. So what happens is the following. These electrons are shared between both atoms. Now, what, what do I mean share? Well, I, it means they're somehow participating in both orbits. I don't know exactly how it looks from inside, but maybe they are rotating not exactly um, uh, around some kind of a common center of gravity or something like this. Um, but in any case, they are participating in both orbits. If you can imagine, they can actually jump from one orbit to another, from one to another all the times. And, that's, and, and, and thus, most of the time, you have two here and correspondingly eight here. 
because these are shared, these are shared, and these are shared. So if these electrons are jumping all the time between these two orbits, they participate, they're filling up, so nothing else can actually come. Because at some moment, you have two electrons here, and they will push out everything else, and some moment you have eight electrons here, and they will push out. So that makes the molecule, molecule stable. Okay? So, so I will use this sharing word. So these are electrons which are sharing uh, between these two, uh, well, one atom of carbon and, uh, and four atoms of um, uh, hydro hydro hydrogen. So that's very important. It, and again, I, I'm not positive about what sharing exactly means, but I'm just suggesting you as a model that these electrons can jump either from this orbit to this orbit or backwards. And all the time they're uh, like oscillating between these orbits. And that's what makes this orbit complete with two electrons and this orbit complete with eight electrons. Four of its own and four borrowed from um, atoms hydrogen. And that's what makes the molecular um, uh, uh, links stable enough. Now, the electrons on the outer uh, orbit of any atom are called valence electrons. And these sharing, it's called covalent bonds. Covalent. Valence electron here and valence electron there. They are somehow shared between atoms and that's what actually makes the covalent bond. Now, this is true for many molecules. And again, uh, we can probably go into examples about what kind of molecules exist and what kind of sharing actually um, exists. Something like molecules of H2O, for instance. That's the water. Same thing. We have certain atom of one atom of um, oxygen and two atoms which are kind of borrowed, and that's what makes the whole thing actually working. Okay, now this is about molecules. How about crystals? Well, with crystals, it's exactly the same thing. Remember, we have. Um, silicon, it has um, 28 particles, 14 protons and 14 neutrons, and 14 electrons are 2 plus 8 plus 4. Again, 4, by the way. Carbon has 4 on the outer orbit, but the outer orbit was the second one. In this case, outer orbit is the third one. doesn't matter. But what, what matters is that valence electrons are on the outer orbit, and there are four, four valence electrons. Now, the other atoms of silicon also have four. So let's just draw it. So uh, I will ignore um, I the, the first and the second orbit. I will uh, draw only the third orbit. So this is my silicon and the valence electrons are on this third orbit and there are four of them. Now let's consider the second atom and it also has four electrons. Now we have similarly here and here and here oh. so what might have happened and it indeed it happens as, as, as our model actually tells us these two electrons are shared, which means they're jumping left and right, left and right. And these electrons are shared, and these electrons are shared, and these electrons are shared. 
Now, since they are shared, they contribute to both orbits, making this 4 plus 4, which is 8, which is a magic number. And for these guys, we have the same thing, actually. It continues. So these are shared, and these are shared, and these are shared, and these are shared, and these, etc. So that's how the whole structure actually is composed. Now, in this case, I draw it on the surface of the board, like two-dimensional thing. In, in reality, it's a three-dimensional thing. In reality, four outer electrons are positioned in such a way that they make a tetrider. Inside you have a nucleus and you have four electrons on four vertices of tetrider. So, in any case, this is a structure which is space 3D structure, but I can just draw it on the board in this way. Because again, with each electron, you have some other electrons in another atom, which looks like this, um, shared electrons shared with, with this one. So that's how we have a crystalline structure. Diamonds have crystalline structure, but not necessarily so. Look, C, carbon, diamond is made of carbon, so it has four electrons, so it also has similar kind of a structure. But we need a huge temperature and pressure to bring these atoms close enough so these covalent bonds start working. Because in a naturally occurring carbon, that's actually not happening. The atoms are so far away from each other that uh, covalent bonds are not really made. But um, under pressure and temperature, we are pressing at atoms of carbon so strongly that we can actually make artificial diamonds. And we do, actually. It's very expensive, but we do. Um, and again, you will have crystalline structure of the diamond. And again, the same four electrons on the outer orbit. So that kind of resembles this in a three-dimensional world. But in a two-dimensional world, it, it looks like this one. Carbon instead of silicon, and you will have a diamond. If the atoms are close enough. But in silicon, it's already close enough, whatever, um, whatever el element we have. By the way, silicon is occurring naturally. Uh, sand is... CO2. It's a dioc dioxide. OK, so that's how covalent bonds are working. They're bringing together atoms, and they're filling up the outermost layers, um, energy layers, or orbit, uh, to uh, some magic number. Eight is a magic number. OK. Um, by the way, semiconductors are also made not only from silicon, but also from germanium. Now, germanium is another element. And what's the difference? Well, germanium has how many? Uh, it has uh, 32 protons, so it's 74. It's 32 protons plus 42 neutrons, and 32 protons are 2 plus 8 plus 18 plus 4. So again, these three first layers, three first orbits are completely filled up, and on the outer orbit we also have four. And again, the similar structure, but only germanium atoms will be here, and outer orbit has also four electrons, and they are making these covalent bonds in exactly the same way. Um, so, and again, impurities will bring certain new electrons or certain electrons will be lost. If it's boron, it's lost. If it's uh, phosphorus, for instance, 
it's extra electrons. And it all depends on how many electrons we have on the outer orbit. On the phosphorus, we have five. So if this is phosphorus, then we have one extra electron, which is not paired. I mean, these are all participating in these covalent bonds, and this one is not. So it's easy to push it out. Just bring a little bit of energy, like heat it up or something like this, and it will start moving and it will be a conductor. And again, if you have a boron, for instance, if it's a boron, then you don't have one electron, which means that neighboring silicon will have a not pair electron, which again um, would, would not actually be um, paired with anything, so you have a hole here, so to speak. And so electron can jump here, and the hole will be there. And then some electrons will jump here. Well, jump means, again, it will start sharing. But then that would actually mean that there is a, a hole somewhere else. And the holes will be moving in exactly the same way. OK, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about internal structure of um, silicon, primarily silicon, and what makes this crystal um, very important for semiconductors. It's all uh, based on covalent bonds and certain magic numbers of how many electrons can fit into one orbit, which makes it stable. That's it. Thank you very much. I would suggest you to read all the notes on the lecture. Go to unisor.com, uh, Physics 14's course, it's electromagnetism, and there is a, a chapter about semiconductors where uh, the theory of semiconductors explained and covalent bonds is one of those lectures. Thank you very much and good luck.